it folly praise that fancy loves i praise and love that child whose heart no thought whose tongue no word whose hand no deed defiled i praise him most i love him best oh praise and love is his while him i love in him i live and cannot live amiss love sweetest mark lands highest theme man's most desired light to love him life to leave him death to live in him delight he mine by gift i his by debt thus seech to other due first friend he was best friend he In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. By thy immaculate conception, O Mary, make my body pure and my soul holy. My Mother, preserve me this, day, this night from mortal sin. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. By thy immaculate conception, O Mary, make my body pure and my soul holy. My mother, preserve me this night from mortal sin. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou amongst women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. By thy immaculate conception, O Mary, make my body pure and my soul holy. My mother, preserve me this night from mortal sin. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. 
Today is the feast of uh, St. Joachim on this 14th of uh, November. He's one of the great defenders of the Holy Unia, which if you've heard of, it's that, uh, that work of bringing the Orthodox of the East into the unity of the one holy Catholic and Apostolic Church under the successor of St. Peter. Uh, that was his, his great life's work for which he lived and for which he died. Uh, he died on the 12th of November, but we keep his feast today. Uh, so more on St. Joseph Fat in a bit. Uh, but for today, a warm welcome to you who are listening uh, from this little island of Papastrancy. It's been a, uh, a blustery, a windy autumn day. Uh, much, But the sun's been shining much of the day, and it's been a nice day for working. Uh, one of those days where they say, you know, good to feel alive, as they say. Uh, Anyway, it's good, good to hear on Papa Stronzi. Before we get to St. Josephat, I wanted to uh, say a few words about St. Lawrence O'Toole. He's the last saint mentioned in today's uh, martyrology reading. And he's the holy monk in Ireland uh, who, very young, became the Archbishop of, of Dublin and died in 1180 uh, while he was journeying in France uh, for the sake of his his archdiocese, but he was in, in France, and I think his relics are still there. And it seemed particularly appropriate to talk about him today because of his devotion to Our Lady, and with today being a Saturday. Uh, there's a, a circumstance which, which highlights how devoted he was, because the Irish have been uh, long very devoted to Our Lady, but there's uh, a series of letters from one of the you could say successor archbishops of, of St. Lawrence O'Toole, uh, who was the Cardinal Archbishop of Dublin, Cardinal Cullen, who in the mid-1800s wrote uh, no, no less than 42 pastoral letters to his flock on devotion to Our Lady. He wrote about other things too, but that was his favorite topic. And uh, he notes in one of them that devotion to Our Lady has been a distinguishing mark uh, of the Diocese of, of Dublin ever since the days of Lawrence O'Toole. Uh, so it's perhaps his, uh, his life is beautiful, but it's, it's, you could say, the crown or the, the most, most uh, notable part is that love for Our Lady. And there's an incident which is uh, very edifying, which I was going to relate here, that shows how he, he keeps the uh, the honor of Our Lady, uppermost in his mind, especially or even in, uh, in the most stressful situations. So the story goes like this. He was uh, trying to build a church in honor of Our Lady. It was one of the many works he undertook as, a, as Archbishop. And in the midst of this, he had to make a journey to England. He, he, had, he had to go there several times to the court of Henry II. Uh, it was right around the time, that was basically the time when um, when England was invading Ireland and taking over that the area of Dublin, and uh, he was trying to keep peace between the two nations. Anyway, he was going there, and as as soon as he got on the ship, uh, several of uh, the merchants of Dublin came to join him. Uh, they they were going to go at some point, and when they saw the Archbishop was going, they wanted the protection of their um, of their holy pastor. And. Um, their hopes were not disappointed because after they set sail and they were on the open sea, a, a terrible storm arose and uh, it was the worst they'd ever been in and they thought each moment that they were about to die. But uh, that was one of the reasons they'd come with, with Archbishop O'Toole and so they, they went to him and knelt at his feet and begged him to save them. And uh, he was... Among them, they were terrified, but he was calm and confident. And he said to them, nice words here, You know that even now a church is being built in Dublin in honor of the Mother of God. Promise me that you will give generously to this work of the, to this work of the goods God has given to you. And I promise you, on the part of God and Our Lady, that the storm will subside and that you will have a safe voyage. And so they took those words as though from the Blessed Virgin herself. And uh, several of them had quite valuable merchandise with them on the, 
on the ship, and so they came right away to make their offering for the church. Uh, and the others promised to give it when they returned. And obviously the Archbishop had been had been illuminated uh, supernaturally by Our Lady because uh, she looked down from heaven and caused a calm to come over the sea from that terrible storm. And so they reached the port uh, in safety and the whole trip was, was safe actually. And, and so they gave thanks to Our Lady and Archbishop Saint, Archbishop Lawrence O'Toole. Um, so a lovely story of, of confidence in Our Lady that uh, was many centuries ago, but obviously Our Lady is not any less powerful now than she was then. And so when we are in storms or maybe even a situation as dramatic as that, who knows, some car wreck or whatever it is, let's keep that, that thought of Our Lady in mind and, and to pray to her, but also that thought of of promising her something. You know, the Psalms are full of these references to vow ye your vows to the Lord and pay them. And that vow gives such great honor to him, something that you're going to do, make a pilgrimage or build a shrine in Our Lady's honor, whatever it be. Uh, so she, she values our prayers, but that's a, a powerful way to, to fortify those prayers, if you will, is to make a promise to Our Lady, of course, then to keep it. Uh, but anyway, the beautiful example there of St. Lawrence O'Toole. remind you the the form of this broadcast uh, we're here for three hours together and the first hour is uh, these notices followed by the holy rosary the second hour is uh, primarily the holy mass preceded by uh, the prayers against satan the apostate spirits and saint patrick's breastplate and and followed by thanksgiving for holy communion and the third hour is for devotion excuse me for devotions uh, which tonight will be uh, the main one, the, the Rosary of the Dolors of Our Lady, the full one tonight. And then again, for Our Lady and for the poor souls, remembering them, uh, one of the indulgence uh, litany, so we'll sing the litany of Our Lady uh, tonight. And then, if time permits, various other kind of individual prayers for the poor souls. And then we end with night prayers of the monastery and uh, the sung Salva Regina for uh, the poor souls. And tonight, being Saturday night, we'll do the solemn Sung Salve Regina. Uh, so there's devotions of the Mass. Uh, as you probably know if you're following this regularly, on Saturday, if it's not a, a second or first class feast, we have the privilege of saying the Mass of our Mother Perpetual Sucker. So we'll, uh, we'll say that tonight with the commemoration of St. Joseph Fat. So that's Mass and devotions. For this next part, I'd like to ask you, uh, please, for your particular attention. I imagine you pay attention anyway, but it's uh, sometimes you try to do more than one thing. And at this point, uh, it's an important thing I want to bring out here tonight, and especially in in terms of for those of us who love the traditional Catholic faith in the scandals that are everywhere today, especially in the church, uh, I want to address uh, what I think is a very grave temptation for those of us who, who want to be traditional Catholics. Uh, and so please, I ask, ask your kind attention. And so starting from St. Josephat, our, our uh, saint of today, he's a, he's a martyr, and so if we had had a uh, his Mass today would have been a red Mass. But what's particularly uh, noteworthy is what he gave his life for. He gave his life for the sake of the Holy Unia, as he said. Uh, he, was, he went to one of the centers of... Uh, there had been an Orthodox movement, basically, to break up. There had been a reunion with Rome, and then um, several towns and areas had had broken off again to join the Orthodox uh, schism, really, if you will. And uh, he went to the center of one of these without any fear, even though he was warned how dangerous it was, uh, to try to, to draw back the flock. And several times he was almost killed. And a few days before his death, he was surrounded by an angry mob. 
And he said to them, You people of Vitebsk want to put me to death. You make ambushes for me everywhere. I am here among you as your shepherd. You ought to know that I should be happy to give my life for you. I am ready to die for the Holy Union, for the supremacy of St. Peter, and of his successor, the Supreme Pontiff. Beautiful words. And a beautiful cause to die for, Holy Unia. And it's still a beautiful and noble cause, even to die for, because it has to do with the salvation of souls. This union with, to be within the communion of the Holy Catholic Church. Uh, it's not just a, a matter of, oh, it would be better if we could do that. It's not just better, it's necessary. In the confusion in the church today, it's, uh, it's very necessary that we hold on to the truths of, of the faith and firmly hold on to them. Those truths that have been taught very clearly in the past and with the full exercise of the rightful authority of the church, especially the highest authority in the church, those ecumenical councils and the popes such as you might find in Denzinger or recorded uh, elsewhere. That's the, that's the easiest way to find it. And one of those truths is that we must be in the one true church, the Catholic Church. There's a famous bull called Unam Sanctum, uh, put out in November of 1302 by Pope Boniface VIII. And in that bull, he reiterates the truth, this truth of our faith in unmistakable terms. He says, With faith urging us, we are forced to believe and to hold the one holy Catholic Church and that apostolic. And we firmly believe and simply confess this Church, outside of which there is no salvation nor remission of sin. And he ends the words with even clearer and more forceful words. This is where I really want to draw out from this bull. These words here he ends with. We declare, say, define, and proclaim to every human creature that they, by necessity for salvation, are entirely subject to the Roman pontiff. It's worth repeating. If you'll bear with me, I'll just say it one more time. We declare, say, define, and proclaim to every human creature that they, by necessity for salvation, are entirely subject to the Roman pontiff. This doesn't mean, of course, that uh, we have to adhere to everything that the Pope says or does. Uh, that would be foolish. The First Vatican Council makes clear that there's, there's uh, certain, very clearly defined uh, conditions for when a Pope or an ecumenical council under him uh, can teach infallibly. And so apart from those, outside of those conditions, uh, the Pope, it's possible that he fall into error. He's not infallible, in other words. But it is clear from the bull, Unum Sanctum, the bit especially that I just, just read out twice, that we must be under the visible jurisdictional authority of the Pope. We must be subject to him. It doesn't mean you have to agree with everything he says or does, but you have to be subject to his, and that means under his jurisdiction. That every cre human creature, by necessity for salvation, be entirely subject to the Roman pontiff. And this is a truth which is very important to underline in these times. Because the more that we hear the scandals and the errors that come out of Rome and even from many bishops, uh, the more we are tempted to take scandal, to withdraw ourselves from the visible jurisdictional authority of the Pope and, and the bishops under him. But we must remember in this, in this regard that scandal is of two sorts. There's active scandal and passive scandal. You can find this in uh, St. Thomas. Uh, I looked up a definition in a traditional moral theology manual. Active scandal is defined as the act itself, which is the occasion of sin for another. While passive scandal is the sin occasioned by another's act. 
So someone does something wrong, and uh, that's going to be a cause or a uh, kind of a impetus to you doing something wrong. You say, oh, he's he's doing that, so I don't I, or oh, I, uh, he's doing that, so I should do this other thing, which which I would not, wouldn't do otherwise. Uh, but the point here is that passive scandal is the sin occasioned by another's act. In other words, it's a sin. It's not just the person that gives scandal that sins. It's the person that takes scandal to do something wrong who sins. And of course, people don't generally mean uh, that they plan to sin when they say, oh, I'm scandalized. It's not how it's used generally in, in common speech. But to let someone else's bad conduct conduct, so maybe a, a cause or uh, an excuse for our failure to do our own duty is in fact a sin. It's, it's passive scandal. And so uh, perhaps the person who gives the scandal, gives active scandal, will get the more, uh, the harsher judgment. You know, like our Lord says, I'll get the, the millstone around his neck. But the one who allows himself to be turned aside by their example from the right path uh, will also be judged. And so when it comes to scandals in the church today, we must remember our duty, that which we ourselves are bound to do, because that is what we will be judged on. The Pope and the bishops have, have their duty. Their duty is to uh, to teach the faith, to preserve the apostolic faith, and preach it by, uh, by example, by words, by acts. Uh, we have to pray for them, that they'll have the sufficient and abundant grace to do that, to fulfill that duty of theirs. But if they don't fulfill it, in the end, that's their fault. But we must still do our duty. And one of the grave responsibilities that we have, according to our state in life, is to be subject to the Roman pontiff, as that uh, bull said so clearly. And if we fail to do that, in the end, it will be our fault. You can sympathize with people that, that withdraw themselves from the, union of, the visible unity of the church and say, oh, they're there's lots of scandals, and it's true, it's terrible. And woe to those that give scandal. But in the end, if we don't do our duty, it's our fault. The Pope and the bishops have to do their duty, but that's not what we're responsible for. We're responsible for our duty, and one of the duties of our state in life is to be subject to their jurisdictional authority. Now, in response to uh, this point, someone may say that uh, if they stay within the structures of the church, that they'll be subject to such a, a deluge, and it is a deluge today, uh, such a deluge of, uh, of error and uh, just immorality, that their own faith will surely suffer as a result. They'll say, I'm, not, I'm just not strong enough to stand against the tide. And so it's an objection that's, that needs, needs dealing with. But there are at least two things that uh, should be said in response to this. The first is that the end doesn't justify the means. It's a basic uh, moral principle that we may never directly intend or do something wrong in order to attain some other good. So this person with this objection uh, he doesn't want to fall into uh, some error or sinful act because of being under churchmen who seem, to, who seem to be leading them astray. But as we've seen, it's a dogma of the faith that we have to be subject to the Roman pontiff. So how, how can it possibly be what God wills that we do now, we embrace now some clear error against the dogma out of the hope of avoiding a possible error or errors in the future. That can't be God's will. He doesn't will that we do something wrong now in order to avoid 
some other possible wrong in the future. Even if it's a, a certain good, you can't do something wrong now in order to get a good later. The end just, doesn't justify the means, it's basic principle. So, I hope that's, anyway, enough on that one. But if such a person is so convinced, just to look at it from a somewhat different angle, is so convinced of uh, the danger of bad leaders and bad environment, if you will, you could ask too, then why don't they leave the world? It's a different way of looking at it, but the world is full of bad leaders, bad, uh, bad philosophy, it's full of lies and immorality. So it's just a deluge. Every time you, you open a, a, a newspaper or a book or step outside, you see it. And so you could say, why shouldn't we all flee to the desert? And I'm not saying it's a bad thing to flee to the desert. So to, to flee this sinful world is a great thing, in a, in a sense. And so we hoped all to get to heaven to flee out of this world. But it's not strictly required of us. Uh, religious life is a good thing, uh, but it's not strictly required of us. What is required of us is that we pray for the grace to remain unspotted from the world, St. James says. And so our Lord prayed for us in just this way. In the Last Supper, he said, this is John 17, I pray not that thou shouldst take them out of the world, but that thou shouldst keep them from evil. And so, you can see the application with the church as well. Uh, Christ doesn't want us to leave the visible structures of the church. He wants us to remain unspotted from evil. And those two things can go together. You know, there's the, uh, the parable of the cockle and the wheat. He allows them to grow up together. And it's a mystery of iniquity. But we know that he, he gives the grace. You see so often in the lives of saints where you have really exalted sanctity, intertwined, in a sense, not in the same person, but they're living in such close proximity and with so much rubbing of shoulders, so to speak, with really wicked people. Uh -huh. And you kind of, don't they like rub off on each other more? But somehow it's, God allows the wicked to have their free will, and he uses them to purify the good, and he gives the good the grace to, uh, to resist whatever it is that might be drawing them to, to evil, even if it's not, even if it's just resentment against all the bad treatment they're getting. Uh, so he gives the grace to remain unspotted from the evil. Uh, so we must uh, truly believe that he will uphold us uh, in, the, in, the, in the way that he has divinely instituted the structures of the church. So that's the first thing to really to say to the, in response to uh, this person. The second, the person who doesn't want to stay within the structures of the church because of all the problems in the church, and especially with churchmen, the leaders, is, is what our Lord says. It's a hard truth, but it's important to remember. This is from the, the uh, Sermon on the Mount. It's, it's chapter 7 of St. Matthew. Enter ye in at the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there are who go in thereat. How narrow is the gate, and straight is the way that leadeth to life, and few there are that find it. There are many ways of falling into error. There's only one way of keeping the Catholic faith. We have to keep it whole and entire. And we do so by believing all the truths, without exception, that have been definitively taught by the Catholic Church. If we deny one of those truths, our faith is no longer divine and Catholic. It's no longer that saving divine faith. It's opinion. Just by denying one of those truths, because we believe it because God has taught it through his church which he divinely instituted it. So if we deny one of those truths, it's the same as saying, God, I don't believe you. And so it becomes opinion. 
It might be an opinion which, which happens to match up with the Catholic faith on almost everything except that one thing, but it's still opinion. It's no longer that divine faith. And we have to have that faith for salvation. And so when we know the truth that Boniface VIII taught so clearly, as Catholics, we give the assent of our intellect and our will to what he said. He said, we define, sorry, we declare, say, define and proclaim to every human creature that they by necessity for salvation are entirely subject to the Roman pontiff. So that's one way of falling into error, to deny that, either um, just you know, abstractly or just in fact. You just say, oh, I'm not going to be subject to his jurisdictional authority. But of course, there's other ways. There's, there's lots of truths, and we have to believe them all. And if, say, the, the Supreme Pontiff does teach, which seems like, anyway, uh, he does teach error by word and by example, Neither in that case can we follow him in that. We must believe with divine faith all the truths which the Catholic faith, the Catholic Church has taught definitively. And uh, a lot of those are very clearly stated by, by popes. You just read Denzinger, read, read the Acts of the Councils and, uh, and popes from the past, and it's very clear what they're teaching. Uh, and so you don't want to be a to speak, overly um, have a false idea of, uh, of faith, the kind of submission of our intellect and will there, where because it wouldn't even make sense to say, well, I believe what the Pope is saying, but then it's going to deny what all these other popes have said with more authority, uh, especially because now it seems like very little is taught with clarity or uh, use of much authority. And so... Uh, we must hold all the truths. The way of salvation is narrow and straight. And so for fear of, of falling into errors by being in the structures of the church, you know, there's a lot of dangers in this life. It's not the only danger, but it is a danger. So we have to be subject to the jurisdictional authority of the Pope. That's what St. Joseph gave his life for. And so may Our Lady and St. Joseph pray for us that we may keep the faith whole and entire in the present day and whatever may come. Um, it's a task which is beyond our strength. It's, it's scary in a sense. You see, wow, the church is... is there's, a, there's a lot of things wrong. But we have to trust in God's grace. And... We have to have that grace. We can only do it by grace to protect us and to keep on the straight and narrow. And so I leave you with the words of St. Paul to St. Timothy. O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, to thy trust, avoiding the profane novelties of words and oppositions of knowledge falsely so called, which some promising have erred concerning the faith. Grace be with thee. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. The Holy Rosary in a couple of minutes. Meretur Spiritus Sancto Cooperante Preparasti, Da ut cuius commemoratione letamu, Eius pia intercessione ab instantibus male set a morte perpetua liberemu, Perium dam Christum Dominum nostrum. Amen. Divinum auxilium maniat semper noviscum. Amen. Amen. Hey.
it fully praise but fancy loves i praise and love the child whose heart no thought whose tongue no word whose hand no deed defiled i praise him most i love him best oh praise and love is his while him i love in him i live and cannot live amiss love sweetest mark lands highest theme man's most desired light to love him life to leave him death to live in him delight he mine by gift i his by debt the siege to other due first friend he was best friend he all times will try him true. Though young yet wise, though small yet strong, though man yet God he is, as wise he knows, as strong he can, as God he loves to Oh.